Welcome to this YES online conversation. YES European, uh, Yalta European strategy, as you know, is uh, together with Viktor Pinchuk uh, Foundation, connecting Ukraine to the world and the world to Ukraine and addressing different global challenges. And in these difficult times, when it's not possible for us to meet as we normally do, Yalta or Kiev, we aim to bridge that gap by these online conversations until we hopefully will be able to meet in person in Kiev again in September of next year. So a number of online conversations will be organized. This is the first one. And uh, we really have a star cast for this uh, premiere of these online discussions. We have Steve Began, who is the Deputy Secretary of State for the United States of America, but also a man who's been around in uh, foreign affairs and national security circles for a long time, well known and a good friend to many of us on this side of the Atlantic. And then Anne Applebaum, who is of course uh, now staff writer on the Atlantic, Pulitzer Prize winning author of numerous books, but perhaps should be mentioned particularly the uh, very good book that she wrote on Stalin's famine war against Ukraine. So um, Steve will talk and Anne will moderate the conversation. And by that, just uh, the floor over to you, Anne. Uh, so good afternoon if you're in Europe, uh, good morning if you're in the US. Um, just to repeat again, this is a yes online conversation. Um, we're having it in lieu of a conference. Um, it's the first of what's going to be several and if you wait, you will eventually get invitations to more and I am speaking to the Deputy Secretary of State, um, Steve Began. Um, Steve, I was told that you want to begin with some comments and I will then follow up with a series of questions. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Anne, and, and thank you too, Carl. Uh, great to see you both, and, and uh, I very much appreciate the invitation to the YES conference. I had uh, uh, every uh, hope of being able to join you in person this year, but for uh, obvious reasons uh, related to COVID, uh, we're going to do this virtually, but still happy to have this conversation. Let me also say at the top that uh, on, on the top of COVID, I'm sure that news has traveled to, to every corner now that uh, the unfortunate news that President Trump and, and uh, Mrs. Trump have, have been confirmed positive uh, for COVID-19. I'd ask all of you uh, to join me in, in, in your prayers for them and their speedy recovery. Um, uh, the, uh, the circumstances are unfortunate, but so far um, uh, the conditions aren't so bad. Also, um, uh, uh, on a more somber note even yet, I'd like to extend condolences to the family at the United States Embassy who are impacted by a terrible tragedy this week. Uh, those circumstances remain under review, but um, uh, our diplomats have been affected uh, uh, by, this, uh, by this event, this, uh, this tragic killing in, in Ukraine. And lastly, uh, and, and still on the, on, on the sad news, we have a, a wonderful diplomat in our embassy in, in Ukraine, in Kyiv, whose husband is being unjustly detained in Minsk currently. He's been held by Lukashenko and his forces now for several weeks. And this is an extremely, uh, 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 extremely troubling issue for every level of the United States government. The President of the United States and the Secretary of State place no higher priority than on the safety and well being of American citizens. And the Belarusian authorities will be well served to release him promptly. Um, I will be happy to come back to that in some of our discussion. But with that, Anne, let me just say a couple words about Ukraine. And then, of course, uh, I'm more than happy to have this conversation go in any direction you want. Um, just two months ago today, actually, I was um, standing, uh, two month, a month ago today, actually, I was uh, standing in Krivi Re, Ukraine, with President Zelensky. Um, we made a visit uh, there, uh, spent an afternoon and an evening in his hometown. Um, I was there with him to lay a wreath at the Ilovaisk uh, Memorial that had just opened uh, in, uh, in the uh, um, War Heroes Park in Kriviri. Um, we had a chance to discuss at some length that afternoon and that evening the, um, the current state of affairs in, in Crimea and in the Donbass. But it was a very personal visit as well as we spent quite a bit of time that afternoon with the mothers, sisters, widows of those who were killed or, or those who remain missing. Um, in uh, eastern Ukraine. And I want to be clear, the United States stands with the Ukrainian people in demanding a restoration of Ukrainian sovereignty over all of its territory. 
Um, during my uh, during my few days in Kiev while I was there, I had a chance to sit down in, uh, with a number of officials um, in Kiev as well, where we um, where we reviewed the current state of play in the Donbass. Um, at the time, we were uh, we were uh, on approximately a 30th consecutive day without. Uh, killing on the uh, line of contact between the occupied territory in eastern Ukraine uh, and, and Ukraine proper. And I have to say that um, while the ceasefires faced some challenges, this was a tremendous accomplishment by the Ukrainian government in its negotiations. And it left some room then for some optimism, which I think still exists uh, for some progress on eastern Ukraine. We reviewed um, the state of reforms uh, in, uh, in the Ukrainian government what uh, uh, President Zelensky and the, and the Prime Minister are seeking to do. And I uh, also had a chance to meet with non-governmental uh, officials who are working very much to support the anti-corruption agenda to hear some of the challenges that they continue to face <clears throat> as they seek to help Ukraine finally get on, a, on the footing uh, that all of us wish it had been on now for, uh, for uh, the last three decades. Um, nonetheless, the uh, visit left me uh, uh, quite optimistic about the future of Ukraine. I think Ukraine has done um, a, a very good job uh, relative to uh, uh, some of its neighbors and others around the world in terms of managing the consequences of COVID-19. That means the economic impact will be less severe, hopefully, for Ukraine. And it leaves the Ukrainian government in a, in a better position to work uh, on, on developing its own economy, including through uh, cooperation with the IMF. So we had a chance to review all that uh, uh, with the Ukrainian officials and also talk about all the relevant issues playing out in the region, including events in Russia, uh, Belarus, and elsewhere. And, uh, and, and with that, Anne, I'd be happy to uh, pitch it back to you and, and go in any direction you'd like to go in this discussion. Good, thank you so much, Steve. Um, I, I, there is a lot to talk about in the world, but I think we will focus this discussion on the region. Um, we won't, we'll stay out of US politics, we'll stick to um, the US and Ukraine and, 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 and Russia and Europe. Um, otherwise, we would be here all afternoon. Um, let me begin with the elephant in the room. Um, and that is the, the, the history of US-Ukraine policy in this administration, um, particularly over the past year. Um, it became clear during, during hearings in, in the US Congress that there was really more than one um, policy towards Ukraine. There was one run out of the State Department um, by people like yourself. Um, and there, there was a second policy that was being run sort of out of the White House, sort of via the president's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. Um, and it had a, it was a kind of second track and it had different goals. Um, tell me from your perspective, who's running that policy now? Which is more important? And how do those two tracks now relate to one another? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, so um, at, uh, on the issues related to, uh, to uh, Ukraine and all the matters that were aired out over the course of uh, late last year and early this year, uh, I, I honestly couldn't add anything to the public record that most of the people haven't already seen or heard uh, for themselves. But let me let me add some perspective instead, which is, that of course the president still runs the government, um, and the president the president is in charge of this government. And everything it does that that's our system, our constitutional system. Of course, Congress has a strong role. The courts have have their responsibilities, but um, but the government, and particularly the executive branch, are under the direction of the president of the United States. And so these policies are all the president's policies. It's you know it may appear if you get into a level of granularity or look look into the uh, internal workings. Um, that uh, the different recommendations come from different parts of the government, fair enough. But I, I would be hard pressed to find an issue um, on the agenda of the United States government that doesn't have the same, uh, same characteristics. Uh, of course, different agencies, different departments make different recommendations. Now, Ukraine is near and dear to you and, and to me, Anne, and, and, and I understand why under a microscope, uh, some of those divisions uh, seem uh, seem uh, uh, at times uh, uh, challenging to, to figure out how it all works together. But the important thing from my perspective is at the end of the day, it does all work together. In fact, uh, as, as I, I think you've heard many times from me and others, we're quite proud of our record on, on Ukraine. We've delivered more than $2 billion in security assistance to Ukraine. Uh, it's, uh, this administration is strongly supported the professionalization of the Ukrainian armed forces and, the, and their improved capacities. Um, that $2 billion in assistance includes lethal military assistance. And let me be clear, the Ukrainian military is far more lethal today than it was six years ago, without a question. 
and anybody who chose to clash with them would pay a far higher price than they did when they ran a uh, little green man across uh, a ragtag uh, militia and, and civilian volunteers with some professional military supporting them. So we find, uh, we find ourselves in a place where Ukraine is much better off four years ago than we, uh, we found it four, year, uh, uh, four, four years ago. Uh, but this also goes to, um, to uh, economic support and, and to the engagement with the Ukrainian government. Yes, there was some turbulence uh, uh, related to, uh, to, the, uh, to the, uh, the matters to which you referred, and, and, and I'm, I'm not going to deny that, but we managed through it. And my visit uh, to Ukraine a month ago was an extraordinarily warm and cooperative visit. I spent quite a bit of time personally with President Zelensky and his team. And, uh, and I, uh, I and all American officials working closely with Ukraine um, expect only, only uh, more good things to come from this relationship. Um, separately, every single Russian official, plus uh, a vast number more, who were under sanctions for their role, one way or the other, in the um, in the uh, invasion uh, and uh, and um, and annexation of territory in Ukraine, are under sanctions and have remained so. Um, there are more people under sanctions today than there were four years ago. Although I will give the previous administration all due credit for moving out uh, with a very tough set of sanctions uh, uh, in response to the invasion of Ukraine. We've only added uh, to their policy successes and, and will we'll continue to do so. So I think we're, uh, you know, I understand, again, the question. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, blind to the, to the issues that you raise, but I, I also think you know, if you just put a, a pin in, in, the, in the map right now and, and say, where are we? I'd say we're, we're certainly much better off than we were four years ago. And so, if President Trump is reelected, you don't foresee once again a linkage between uh, military aid to Ukraine and other kinds of policies or other or, or other plans. There it's are now, no linkages. Now... Uh, there are no linkages of uh, uh, military aid to Ukraine to any other extraneous matters. Although we continue, um, and I referenced this in my opening comments a moment ago, we continue to be concerned about corruption in Ukraine. Um, President Zelensky is is taking this on as a high governing priority, and we commend him for that. But that doesn't make it easy to resolve those issues, and so those issues remain out there. Um, and those issues really were the uh, petri dish in which so many other things happened over the course of the last not just four years, and but the last eight, ten, twelve years. Um, it, Ukraine has been like a like a uh, a, a flame to the moth. Uh, for a variety of corrupt interests from across uh, across the breadth of American society and politics. And it's, it's one that I think we all have to uh, join hands with the Ukrainian people to turn back. Okay, let's return again to that in a minute. I'm, um, I'd like to pursue that. But one other um, connected question. Um, I spoke yesterday to several colleagues in Kiev, um, and I asked them about the American presence there and what they thought of the U.S.-Ukrainian relationship at the moment. And um, several of them said that they felt that the U.S. Embassy had gone, was much quieter than it once was, um, that it wasn't so visible, and of course one of the most important factors in that is the absence of, a, of an ambassador. Um, any idea when there will be a U.S. ambassador to Ukraine? Yeah, so we're very excited. I, I think you know this, but um, uh, retired General Keith Dayton, who's uh, one of our nation's greatest experts on Ukraine, is closely uh, worked closely with the Ukrainian government over a number of years, both in his, during his time in uniform as well as afterwards as an as a advisor on defense issues. Um, uh, Keith is in the, in the final stages of approval by the United States Senate. Uh, I uh, just was uh, yesterday uh, in touch with the offices of both Leader McConnell and, uh, and uh, Leader Schumer to, to once again push very hard for him and several other highly capable nominees to finish their way through the system. I would be very hopeful, but I can't guarantee it because it's in the hands of the Senate, but I'd be very hopeful that we'll be able to send a, uh, a confirmed U.S. ambassador out to Ukraine uh, uh, before the end of this month. And, uh, and uh, he's all the way through the process. He's got widespread uh, support on, from both the Democrats and the Republicans. And I do think that will address this, this gap that you mentioned. Our, our embassy team in Kyiv has been uh, ably led by our charge aid affairs. And we've got a great set of diplomats there, including some who, um, as I referenced earlier, are working under extraordinarily difficult circumstances. But nonetheless, to answer your question, of course, we need an ambassador there. That's what 
That's what gives focus and visibility to the U.S. relationship in any country around the world. And, uh, and I think General Dayton uh, will be on his way, uh, hopefully, uh, again, before the end of October. That leads me to one other um, kind of, I mean, it's not really a difficult question, but another political question, which is one of continuity. Um, of course, neither you nor I have any idea who will win the election and who will be president in January, and we no need to, to speculate here. Um, and we can assume that if President Trump remains um, in office, that he will, this, is, this will be his ambassador. Um, you, as it happens, you know Joe Biden. Um, you've, you've, you've worked with him before. Um, would you foresee any kind of change in U.S. policy should he become the next president? What's your view about, about continuity? And maybe you could reflect a little bit about, um, you know, you speak also to members of Congress, you speak to senators, you, you, you know the State Department as well. What is there, a, can you describe elements of continuity that there would be um, in the U.S.-Ukrainian relationship if there is a change of in the White House, um, and maybe elements of discontinuity, if you think there could be those two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, 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 if I was a betting man, uh, I would put my money on continuity for sure. Uh, I, I know, uh, you know whether it's on the personnel side or or on the policy side, <clears throat> there's great uh, great harmony uh, on issues related to U.S.-Ukraine relations. Notwithstanding uh, the degree to which these issues got tangled up into our political process which is unfortunate, but separate from that, in terms of the policies that the United States has toward Ukraine, I expect it actually to be uh, consistent. You know, the one, the, one, um, the one variable here, the one, uh, the one new thing, which I think is quite promising, isn't, um, isn't the, uh, the change in US presidency, but the Ukrainian presidency. I actually, uh, uh, having sat down with, uh, and, 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 the, uh, and the government, I, having sat down with the government and reviewed what they're doing on policy, and particularly in relation to negotiations with, uh, uh, with Russia uh, to regain the sovereignty of Ukraine over its territory, I was quite impressed. Um, you know, uh, we're happy to help, but of course, uh, we have an important role to play here in, uh, in, in, in supporting the government of Ukraine in its endeavors. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm quite, uh, I was quite impressed, pleasantly surprised and impressed by how much success they've had um, representing their own interests and we're more than happy and I'm sure uh, the next president of the United States, whoever wins the election, will continue to fully support the Ukrainian government in that regard. Walk me through scenarios for ending the war in Donbass. Um, you know, if you were to describe what is the U.S. administration's current strategy uh, when we look at the region, and we, and we think about, you know, how, not just how to support Ukraine and make sure the Ukrainian army remains strong and, and, and supply them with weapons, which I appreciate is extremely important and I'm not, I'm not downplaying it, but is there, a long, you know, is there a longer vision? How do we bring this war to an end and what does that begin to look like? How, how, would, how would you describe that from your point of view? Yeah, so um, uh, this probably is, is a, uh is a uh, distinction without a difference, but let me do that analytically instead of as a, as a policy, uh, as a uh, US official, uh, because I don't wanna in any way appear to be second guessing the Ukrainian government, its decisions, and ultimately the Ukrainian government owns this. It's their, it's their country, it's their sovereignty they're seeking to defend, and they're entitled to, to develop their own strategy. But analytically having watched it over the last six plus years, more, a lot more than that, but that in particular since the, um, since the Maidan, I'd say a couple things. One is, I think the institutions uh, or, or constructs of the Minsk group uh, and, the, uh, and the Normandy group, Minsk, the Minsk II agreement and the Normandy group um, still are relevant here. Um, they may not be perfect, but they are, they are uh, the tools that we have. And, and I, I think we still need to find ways to use those with US engagement and US support. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, that, that's the path that, that uh, we're kind of on. It would be per very hard to take the horse cart over the wheel ruts right now. Uh, it may be at some point necessary, but for now, I would stick with that. In terms of the sequence of events that that uh, that needs to play out, um, you know, I think the first focus is is likely going to be on on the Donbass uh, and uh, and uh, east on eastern Ukraine. And here, uh, the Ukrainian government, I think their uh, their move to uh, to try to put in place a more durable ceasefire 
is an important first step. I know that that came with some political controversy in Ukraine, although as it extended for longer and longer periods and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and young soldiers uh, were not dying at the, at the rate that they have over the last six years, I think the, the wisdom of this approach has become a little bit more apparent. And I think the Ukrainian government has won more support. I think ultimately uh, the ceasefire is necessary to get a reduction in violence and a reduction in tensions sufficient to take the other steps that are gonna be necessary to really regain uh, Ukrainian sovereignty over this territory. Uh, notwithstanding the sequence of events in the Minsk II Accord, I think an early and high priority has to be security in, in, the, uh, in Eastern Ukraine. That means some kind of control over the border of Ukraine. That also means um, all, uh, uh, some presence uh, uh, on the territory of, um, of Luhansk and Donetsk that that is um, responsible independently for maintaining uh, stability so that other conditions can develop, uh, including the, the holding of elections. Um, of course, holding of elections requires some predetermination on, on the political status as well. So that needs to be resolved. Uh, this doesn't all hap have to happen sequentially. Some of this can happen uh, uh, simultaneously. And then finally, uh, and most importantly, in here, the United States and, and the EU and, and the and international institutions have a strong role to play. We need a strong financial package, a strong financial incentive that shows all the people of Ukraine, including the ones that live in, uh, in the Donbass, that they're part of a Ukraine that can be prosperous and successful. And, and not counterintuitively, this is why it's so important what, what the government is trying to do right now in Kiev is to create a, a more vibrant, transparent, uh, law-based economy in Kyiv, which will create a benefit for all of Ukraine, uh, and to be able to fold uh, the Donbass into that ultimately, uh, and show the people of Donbass that there is an economic future for them that's that's actually quite good. Now that's on the that's on the Ukraine side. On the Russian side, I think the Russians, the Russian government, uh, needs to understand sanctions will not be lifted. The economic pressures on Moscow will continue and qu may quite well even worsen if the the Russian government doesn't engage in a constructive, honest diplomatic process to return the sovereignty of Ukraine in the Donbass. Now, the Crimea is going to be a tougher issue. Um, and I, I think that's going to take a, a much longer period to resolve. I don't, I don't in any way diminish uh, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, annexation of Crimea. Uh, and, and fully, it is the United States policy to fully support the sovereignty of Ukraine on Crimea, but I think we're going to have to start with the Donbass. So there are two elements of, of the security situation in eastern Ukraine that I know bother Ukrainians the most. One is the question of how the border would be secured, um, and there's a there's a there's a question about could there be an international or presence, one perhaps even involving the U.S. Is that something you can envisage? Um, the second. This, the second element, I suppose, is, is more difficult for to, to see how there's a U.S., you know, how the U.S. contributes to the solution. But the second element is um, the population of Donbass has been living under the rule of these um, so-called quasi-independent republics for a number of years now. Um, they've been subject to very heavy propaganda. Um, the difficulty of integrating them back into Ukraine isn't just an economic question. It's also a kind of ideological and educational um, question. And there, there, I was witness to a really interesting argument between two Ukrainian friends about whether we should do it or not, and if so, when, you know, how dangerous would this, would this integration process be for, um, for the stability of Ukraine? Um, do you have any thoughts about either of those two problems? I mean, those seem to me the two that, you know, if we did get closer to some kind of solution, those would be the two that would present the the most difficulty. Yeah, so on the border issue, uh, uh, again, uh, when I talk about security issues, that's the primary security issue. It's very hard for me to envision a situation in which uh, the government in Kyiv can hold free and fair elections in the Donbass without uh, some, uh, some uh, demarcation of what the, what the reach of its sovereignty is. And that, that of course, first and foremost includes the, uh, the uh, confidence that the border is controlled, whether that happens through OSCE or, or a multinational force or a coalition of the willing. Um, 
the, you know, the Ukrainian government is ultimately going to have to decide for itself where its comfort level is. And, and of course, uh, it's unfortunate, but it's a reality that, that it, 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 to some extent, they're going to have to reach an agreement with their neighbor as well on how this is done. Um, of course, we will back the Ukrainian government as it moves in that direction. And if they wanted to request U.S. support in any way, it's something that I think we'd be happy to consider, but we'd have to understand exactly what they're asking. Regarding um, the, uh, the deeper issues of, of societal division that already were there and exploited in 2014, but now uh, undoubtedly have worsened, not only through propagandization, but quite honestly, and through, through the tragic circumstances of a conflict on both sides. Innocent civilians have been killed in the Donbass, just as innocent uh, civilians have died in other parts of Ukraine. And it's just, it's a tragic uh, uh, product of conflicts like this. And so the, the emotions will be raw and, and it will take uh, some time to ameliorate that. But the world is full of, his, our history is, world history is full of, of examples where societies have overcome these kinds of divisions. It takes time. It takes some uh, form of accountability for sure. And there is going to have to be accountability for any crimes committed on either side. Um, at some level, that's going to be uh, worked out and figured out uh, by the parties to the conflict themselves. And then ultimately, uh, one has to create um, the incentive. You know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a bit uh, of a pragmatist when it comes to negotiations of any kind, uh, that first you need to figure out the incentives, and then, and then you figure out if you have a pathway to success. And in this case, there's an enormous incentive potentially for the people of Eastern Ukraine who currently live uh, under uh, outside of the sovereign control of the Ukrainian government. A, a reintegration into the Ukrainian economy, uh, a brighter future for themselves and for their children. I, I can't imagine that, that it's a, I haven't been to the Donbass, uh, uh, and, uh, but I can't imagine that, that it's a very uh, successful or very uh, economically viable proposition uh, for the people there. And this is one thing that Ukrainian government really can offer, and we can work with them to offer this, which is economic opportunity for the generations to come. And that's, it's not easy, um, and it'll be uneven, um, but uh, that's how you, that's how you overcome the kind of tensions and, and raw motion that, that one finds at the end of a conflict like this. Let me probe you just um, just for one more question on the on the issue of corruption, because both the IMF and the EU have, in recent weeks, made rumblings about um, not approving further tranches of money because they are less than happy about the, uh, you know about about the anti-corruption program in Ukraine, about whether it's really working, whether the government's sincere about it. Um, what what's the U.S. position? You know, the U.S. is U.S. is of course part of the IMF. So what is the what is the U.S. position on those issues, and is that something that you discuss with President Zelensky? Yeah, so um, there's no daylight between us and our European friends on this, and, and 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 you know honestly, we hear the right things from the Ukrainian government as well. I don't question President Zelensky's commitment or the Prime Minister's uh, commitment uh, to uh, to execute this agenda, but that doesn't make it easy. Of course, there's Ukraine is a democratic society. Um, the RADA uh, has a, a strong voice in these matters. And I'd say that if I had concerns anywhere, it's in the RADA. Uh, it's, it's some of the uh, traditional forces and influences that we, that we have seen in the past that are seeking to erode the commitment of the government against, uh, in its fight against corruption. I had a chance when I was in Kyiv a month ago uh, to sit down uh, uh, for a, a lengthy discussion with the leaders of several NGOs, media outlets, and, and also a member of the RADA, uh, who are all united in their joint efforts to fight against um, against corruption. Uh, and uh, some of them have, have suffered personal consequences for this fight. One, uh, one had her car set afire, one had his home burned down while he, his wife and children were, were, uh, were, were not at home. And so uh, it's clear that there's pushback. That pushback manifests itself in, in everything from street violence uh, to political corruption. And, and, uh, and, and anybody who is pushing Ukraine in that direction know, needs to know full well that they will not uh, have any, any support. In fact, they'll have the outright opposition in the United States, the EU, the IMF, and they'll deprive themselves of the very resources that their country needs in order to have a prosperous future. Um, if I could leave it on one slightly optimistic note, 
uh, one of the corruption, anti-corruption campaigners told me that notwithstanding even some of the personal risk that, um, that they faced, that they didn't see this entirely uh, as, a, uh, as a discouragement because they felt that the resistance was greatest because for the first time they were close to actually achieving the agenda they've advocated for so long to make their country a more uh, transparent and rules-based society. And so as, as, as concerning as it is to see attacks on these individuals, their own view is it's a sign of their success, not failure, that this is happening. Kind of the uh, last ditch effort or the behavior of a cornered animal in the case of some of these uh, corrupt individuals and oligarchs. So I am, uh, I am encouraged that there are still uh, great leaders in Ukraine, both in the government and in civil society. Um, there are, uh, uh, I think this is where the Ukrainian people are. So the, uh, they're on the right side of history and the right side of their electorate. Uh, and we'll do everything we can to give the incentives and, and keep pressure on the Ukrainian government uh, to finally at this moment, take care of issues that have plagued uh, Ukraine and undermined its sovereignty for three decades. Mm -hmm. um, to, to, to move over slightly um, from Kiev to Minsk, um, the US has not been as visible in the conversation about Minsk um, and with the Belarusian opposition as some European countries have. Um, and has, you know, um, you know, there have already, some European leaders have already met with Tsikhanovskaya um, in, uh, Macron was, was in, in Lithuania a couple of days ago, um, and there's been a, a, you know, a lot of public discussion in the European Parliament um, and elsewhere. Um, does the U.S. have a role in helping to end this conflict? And if so, what is it? Yeah, so uh, first let me, uh, let me uh, uh, slightly, uh, counter your, your premise on, on, uh, on the role the United States is playing. Uh, the, um, from the very beginning, Sec Secretary Pompeo was actually in Warsaw when the, uh, when the, uh, when the uh, theft of the Belarusian election occurred and he joined side by side with the then foreign minister in condemning the events that were happening in Belarus and calling for the right of the Belarusian people to ha uh, have a uh, free and fair election to determine their own leadership. And we have echoed that message consistently in the, uh, in the, uh, the months since. Um, I, I was the first uh, senior, US, a senior foreign official to actually sit down with Svetlana Tsikhanouskaya a month and a half before the president of France, a month before the president of France arrived. Um, and while I don't by any means rate at the same level of the elected president of France, I wanna assure you that we, uh, we were uh, immediate in, in connecting with the Belarusian opposition as well. And my visit was preceded by uh, direct outreach between the United States Embassy and, and uh, Mrs. Sukunus Sukunuskaya. By the way, just as an aside, she is an incredibly impressive leader, um, humble, uh, uh, considers herself an accidental leader, but feels the full weight of history on her shoulders uh, to help lead her people to a, a brighter future. And I want to emphasize again uh, what I told her in person is that she has the strong support of the United States in her efforts. Um, as far as our policies go, and we joined with the Estonians to invite Mrs. Tsikhanouskaya to address the UN Security Council. Um, uh, she she uh, has, uh, has done that as well as uh, 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 efforts at the EU. We led in the OSCE uh, on uh, setting up a process that can be a catalyst for transforming uh, Belarus, provided that the Belarusian authorities seek the repression of their own people and open up a true dialogue with civil society. The uh, chairman in office, uh, Troika, that, uh, that is in place is prepared at a moment's notice to help uh, bridge that dialogue, to facilitate it between the, the uh, uh, legitimate civil society in opposition with the Belarusian government. Unfortunately, the ruler of Belarus continues to cling uh, to, a, uh, to a, an oppressive set of policies enforced by a goon squad, which is uh, only, uh, only uh, uh, deterred when their identities are shared with their own people, which is such a sad, sad, state of affairs in Belarus. Um, uh, we, have, uh, we have worked closely with our, our allies in the UK and Canada and with the EU uh, uh, in order to uh, find ways to increase economic pressure on the Belarusian authorities. Uh, the UK and Ireland, excuse me, the UK and Canada moved out with sanctions on Tuesday. Our processes and the EU processes 
moved a little bit slower. I believe the EU before the end of today in Europe will have announced a, a, an additional set of sanctions and we are looking ourselves at additional sanctions. We actually already have our sanctions in place against 16 uh, leaders in Belarus, including President Lukashenko himself, uh, as well as several enterprises. And we, we are looking at expanding uh, that in order to address uh, any of the individuals who have newly uh, uh, shown uh, to play a role in either the theft of the elections or in the, uh, uh, the repression of the Belarusian people. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got uh, uh, plenty, uh, uh, plenty on our plate and our agenda related to Belarus, just like our European friends uh, and allies do. Uh, it's great to be working closely with them on this issue and so many others. I'd be remiss if I didn't in particular call out the governments of Lithuania and Poland, who have really bravely at the, at the front lines of this uh, played a strong role that validates all of our expectations um, on, on, uh, on, uh, that underpinned the arguments to bring these countries into our alliances and institutions in Europe uh, uh, decades ago. Um, they are great partners. They are great representatives of, of the democratic uh, values that we want to see play out in Belarus. And I'm hopeful that, um, that, uh, that we will uh, continue to find ways to be more effective. But let me just say as a last word, that uh, all of this ultimately uh, you know, rests on the, uh, the awesome courage of the Belarusian people, and particularly the women of Belarus, who now for several weeks in the face of, of severe repression and arrests and, and, uh, and mistreatment, uh, have bravely taken to the streets of Belarus in, in a manner that has most of us eager to, uh, to open, uh, open our news apps on Sunday to just see the inspirational uh, uh, manifestation of people who are demanding democracy for their country. Uh, it's great to see. It, 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 it inspires us, the more established democracies, to see this. And, uh, and uh, we're fully with the people of Belarus. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying that. I mean, I, I suppose the difference between us and the Europeans is that we haven't had a presidential statement of that kind. But I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate you saying that. Um, so for the final, I mean, the, 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 the kind of, you know, the, the, the other elephant in the room in, in, in many senses is of, course the, is, of course, Russia and the Russian leadership. Um, um, uh, you know, we, the, the, the attempt to murder Alexei Navalny, um, his presence currently in Germany, um, he's been visited already by Chancellor Merkel. Um, if you were to step back and characterize um, Western Russian relations right now, and you were to again try and look at it as, as somebody doing strategy. Um, is there is there a way? Um, do do we have do we still have tools and leverage over Russia? Are we still able to stop and hinder some of this behavior? And, and among other things, for example, we know that the Russians have sent reinforcements of various kinds into Belarus. We know that they're they're at least at least. Um, pumping up the police or supporting the police in some ways. Um, do we have a long-term plan for how to deal with a, a, a state that, you know, on, our, on the borders of Europe, on the borders of the West, um, which is still um, openly intervening in the affairs of its neighbors and in the affairs of us too? Yeah, uh, tough question, Anne, and, and one that I revisit uh, on a regular basis myself with, with our team here at the State Department and with the White House. The, um, the president came into office, uh, I think, hoping to uh, take a fresh start with U.S.-Russian relations, just as many presidents have uh, in, in recent past. Um, of course, uh, he was bedeviled by the uh, lingering controversy of Russia's uh, attempts to interfere in our elections, and particularly their information campaigns to polarize our society, all of which, all of which uh, affected the, the uh, space that, um, that the administration would have had to maneuver on U.S.-Russian re relations. Um, as I think you know, Anne, uh, uh, while well, I've spent uh, the vast majority of my career working on Central and Eastern European issues, at the center of that uh, is my experience with Russia over many years. I first lived in Russia 35 years ago. Uh, I was a student in the Soviet Union in Leningrad, and I, I've been deeply engaged with with uh, with Russia generally uh, for all that period. Um, I have never seen Russia as a monolith. In fact, uh, oftentimes I, I try to catch myself even when I when I speak about the Russians or about Russia because Russia is not not a monolith, but Russia is certainly uh, also uh, not run like a pluralistic democracy where that 
has the same consequences it might be in a society like ours, for example, where you have many voices and many sources of influence. But um, uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, you know, I have even in my uh, in my tenure in the administration, which is from about the middle of the administration to, to present day, look to see if there was any place or any opportunities where we might have uh, to engage directly with the Russian government in order to try to explore whether or not we could move in a different direction, whether that's a Ukraine negotiation, whether that's a new start agreement, whether that's uh, some sort of um, restarting uh, an economic dialogue you know, uh, or civil society dialogue, any, any domain of, of a normal relationship with other countries. And I have this, uh, this singular experience in, in, in relation to the Russian Federation, which uh, as somebody who, who cares deeply about the relationship, I have found uniquely frustrating, which is there's no space. There's simply no space. So after these circumstances in Belarus in early August, we made a decision to engage with the Russian government in order to discuss um, how, to, how to best take on the consequences of what was an utterly fraudulent election with severe repression in the aftermath of the Belarusian people, a people incidentally who have a natural affinity to the Russian Federation and which came of great concern to the Russian people. And you watch it close enough, close enough to know that in the, in the days following the Belarusian election, Russian sympathies were clearly with the people on the streets of Belarus, not with Lukashenko. And I think, I think, I think the ruler of Belarus knows full well that as soon as things quiet down, he's going to get the hook. There's no question. There is no question in my mind that the Russian government has absolutely no tolerance uh, for, for the current ruler of Belarus. I think, I think what's likely is that they probably also don't quite want to let go while they haven't managed the process to put in place somebody of their choosing. That might be the challenge. But as far as Lukashenko goes, uh, there's no love lost there. And, uh, and, and that's clear. So I actually I uh, planned a trip uh, uh, to Moscow, uh, in addition to visiting Vilnius to meet with Mrs. Tsikhanouskaya and other stops along the way. Uh, uh, and you know, uh, uh, this trip goes on the schedule one week and the next week, uh, Alexei Navalny is poisoned on a plane between Tomsk and Omsk. And I, I, I will tell you what I told the Russians, you know, you guys, they, they just, they can't control this stuff and it doesn't allow any space, any space to explore what a constructive relationship would look like. Now they have, they have to do a complete and thorough investigation. There has to be accountability for the poisoning of Alexei. It's unacceptable. My goodness, imagine if somebody had used a nerve agent on American soil, what the United States government would be doing right now. We'd have congressional hearings. We'd have FBI investigators and WMD experts prowling this, the place where that happened and the circumstances. And it would be a matter of national attention. Alexei Navalny was poisoned with a banned nerve agent. In the view of the United States, um, those capabilities are only available to state institutions. Somebody's got to stop this. Uh, and the impunity with which it's happened is deeply concerning to the United States, not only because of the severe human consequences, and of course, that's enough in and of itself, what happened to uh, Alexei Navalny, or, or uh, Vladimir Karamurza, or for that matter, a string of other officials, Skripal, um, Litvinenko, Volkovskaya, Nimtsov. Not only is it concerned at that level, but the impunity with which it happens. We have people using chemical weapons with impunity in today's world. That is crossing a norm which is unacceptable to any country in the world, and we need the Russian government to take this very seriously. So thank you, Steve. I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time. I mean, I'm, I'd love to continue the argument. You know, my, my conclusion from what you just said is, and, uh, is that the Russian government doesn't actually want a good relationship with the US or rather it prioritizes other things and sending the message to Russian protesters that we will get you if you are too successful, sending the message to Belarus protesters that you can't win um, through this kind of campaign. Um, you know, all, all of that matters to them, unfortunately, more um, than, than the relationship with the US and with the West. Um, but once again, thank you. I know this is a very distinguished audience. Um, thank you all very much for joining. Um, I'm told that the 
um, a, a version of this conversation will be found on the YES website starting on Monday. And I'm also told that everybody who's on this call and who's listening um, will be invited to other conversations and just wait for the invitations. They'll be coming in due course as the, as the YES online um, debates uh, continue through the next couple of months. Thank you so much, Steve. I really, really appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. Um, I, I appreciate you know, very much what you said. So thank you very much to all. Thank you, Anne.